Listen up, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and agents. You're in the right place. Unlocking the secrets to real estate investing and entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Titanium Vault, hosted by RJ Bates III. Here's RJ. Hello, and welcome to the Titanium Vault. I'm your host, RJ Bates. Today, I'm sitting down with Max Maxwell. Max, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, RJ. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do in real estate investing. Well, like uh, RJ said, my name is Max Maxwell, and uh, I specialize in the wholesaling side of real estate investing, where basically we go out and uh, find deeply discounted properties in order to uh, uh, sell to other investors that do fix and flips or, or buy and hold investors. We're basically the guys that go out and do the dirt and find the properties that are not for sale uh, and, and, and be able to make a small margin in between each deal and still pass on enough meat and bones for everybody else. Man, I'm, I'm so excited because, you know, my main background in real estate investing is in wholesaling. So uh, I'm excited to have a fellow wholesaler on here. I've had a lot of rehabbers and, and, you know, big time buy and hold guys, you're one of the first main wholesalers. So I, I look forward to today's episode. Let's start off by telling us what markets you're in that you wholesale. So right now, I'm currently in the central Piedmont part of North Carolina, which is uh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem and High Point. Uh, I would say 90 percent of our business is really out of Winston-Salem, uh, which is for Scythe County. And uh, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. I'm looking to get into some parts, other parts of the country. I've started to dibble and dabble in Orlando, Florida. Um, but right now, we've got our plate full right here just in little North Carolina. Would you say the majority of your wholesale properties are fix and flips or rentals? Fix and flips for sure. Um, we just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, we have a little older demographic, so some of the houses need work. And we're just we're just in a great market right now where, you know, you're fixing, you're flipping, you're selling, and it's you know days on market is pretty short. Right. So how did you get your start in wholesaling? So I used to be a broker back when I was 21 after I got my get out of the Air Force as an active duty airman, and um, I I got into regular traditional real estate, buying and selling other people's property, and then I just didn't have the patience. I didn't like driving people around on Sundays. So I quickly got into, uh, a year later, I got into the investment side of things where I started my own property management investment company. And that lasted a little while. Um, I managed a pretty large portfolio, uh, mainly from all one guy. But then, obviously, everybody has a story. The economy collapsed and real estate kind of went to bed. When I was one of those guys that left real estate, I went into the marketing world, moved out west to Los Angeles, uh, started doing some things out there, and then... You know, as the real estate market picked back up here recently, about two years ago, I moved back in uh, 2015, moved back to North Carolina to start getting back into real estate because real estate is crazy expensive in Los Angeles and uh, just decided to pick up another path. I didn't get my real estate license back active, so I decided to do something that didn't require it. And I got into wholesaling and, and I've heard about it before as an agent, but when I really dug deep into it this time, I really found my passion and, and, and can mix the marketing world and the real estate world together in order to, to make some good income. What were some of the first steps that you took to start your wholesaling business? Well, you know, I took the time to really listen to a bunch of podcasts, uh, the free YouTube content out there. And since I, since I knew about real estate in my market, you know, I was comfortable knowing the numbers, what houses were worth. I kind of understand the idea. You go out and find something that's not for sale at a deeply discounted price, put it under contract, and then sell the contract to somebody that can execute or wants to execute that contract on your behalf. So I took that and I just, you know, learned the term driving for dollars as I was doing podcasting. Found my first two properties, and in my first month, I made twenty-one grand. I never looked back. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to get started and uh, make you know proves the concept pretty quickly. Yeah. So when you when you were starting the business, was your main focus on finding properties or was it finding the cash buyers first? So I always figured that cash buyers are going to be there because I've never had the limiting mindset that money was limited. 
I know there's so much money out there that if I can just find a deal, anybody will buy it. I mean, if I can find a bushel of apples at the right price, I can get somebody to buy them. You know, so I never really, really was too concerned about who's going to buy this property from me. I just knew that if I get it at a great deal, anybody with the money, even if they're not into real estate, would see that, wait, I just need to buy this because it's just an opportunity. Right. And, and I always give that advice as well, especially nowadays with social media. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, if you find a great deal, you have a million different outlets that you can get it out there to the right people, even if you don't know them personally. And one of the biggest turnoffs that I've seen for a cash buyer is when you go to them and you say, hey, I'm a wholesaler. I want to bring you deals. And they say, cool, let me see a deal. If you don't have a property, it's immediately like, eh, that was kind of a waste of my time. You know, I'd rather see a deal than anything else. And so I always advise people that want to get into wholesaling, go find a property. That's how you're going to build your buyer's list right then and there. You're going to see who actually is interested in buying properties at that point in time. So I, I agree with the strategy that you took there. Um, in North Carolina, when you're wholesaling a property, do you do assignments or do you do double closes? So one of the main things in my business is now that we've grown to such a size that we are now, all of our cash buyers are interviewed. Um, and these are the serious ones. And, and one of the big questions we ask them, say, listen, if I find a property for $1 that's worth 150000 and I wholesale it to you for 60000 and I make $59,999, do you care if the numbers still work for you? And if the answer is they don't care, then they get on our, our buyer's list and it doesn't matter. So we try to eliminate double closings by doing only assignments. I've only had to double close on one property um, just because the, the, the numbers were just so good and I just felt comfortable and it was just it was just almost easier to close on it myself and then turn around and sell it. So, yeah, all assignments is where we work with. And if anybody complains, we automatically just take them off the buyer's list and we move to the next guy. Right. In North Carolina, when you do a double close, do you have to actually close on it, or can you do a pass-through of funds where you still don't have to bring any funds to closing? So my attorney, and I've been working with one attorney for a long time. I have another attorney, but my my main attorney is not comfortable with doing double closing. So I've grown my business around his strategy, and he's probably one of the best attorneys. I can get a property, and he's ready to close in, you know, 36 hours. So, I, it, you know, to have him being able to move so quickly, speed kills in this business. And for me to be able to have an attorney that does it that quickly, I'll figure a way around and not doing the double closes. So I've never, never really and never really used it. So if I use this attorney, I'm actually going to have to bring cash to the table. Gotcha. So for people that might be looking to get into wholesaling or are just curious about real estate investing, and they don't understand what we're talking about. Walk them through what an assignment contract is. So it's real simple. You go out and you find anything. And since we're talking about houses, we'll keep it there. You go out and find a house that is deeply discounted. Let's just say the house is worth $100,000. Somebody really doesn't want the house. They don't live in it. It needs a lot of work. What you do is you, you enter into a purchase agreement with that person. And let's just say you give yourself 30 days, right? I typically do 30 days or less. I usually execute within 10. I say, hey, listen. I want to buy this house cash from you at $20,000. The person's happy with that price. We enter into a contract that, let's just say, lasts 30 days. Within that 30 days, the owner of that property can't do anything with it as far as selling it, leasing it, because you have the right to purchase it. You then have what they call equitable interest in the property. So for 30 days, you essentially tie that property up. And I don't like to use the word tie because it has a negative conversation right now. We basically have a contract that nobody else can use. So since we own the contract, we can sell that contract or assign it to somebody else that is willing to execute that contract as I have written. So for example, if I have it under contract for $20,000 and there's enough room for me to make $10,000, I can sell my contract to that fix and flipper for 10 grand and then he goes and closes on the property for 20 grand and all together, he spent about $30,000 on a house that's worth $100,000. He puts his $20,000 in rehab in it. Now he's got fifty grand in it, and he turns around and sells it for $100,000. You know, he's roughly going to make fifty grand minus closing costs and all that other stuff like that. 
So right. it's pretty simple. Yeah. And that's a great explanation of an assignment contract. And that's why it's so important for you to interview your cash buyers up front to find mm -hmm. out, are they going to have an issue with how much money you're making when you wholesale a property to them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How often has have you had a problem with one of your buyers, even after the interview, have they complained, hey, man, you know, you're making, you know, 15, 20,000 on this deal. Has that happened to you or how often does it happen? It happened to me twice. One when I first started, second just last week. Um, there was a, a house that we were making about 20 something thousand on and the guy really wanted to go down on a price because he's seen what we were making. And uh, I basically said, hey, listen, uh, I, I'm glad you wanted to, you know, it's good doing business with you, but unfortunately you don't fit uh, what we want to do business with. And I just basically did not sign my contract after he had so many questions and edits and I moved on to the next guy and that property actually closed yesterday. So it's, you know, the buyers are out here. Once I control the deal, you can't, you can't force me to do something different because it takes a lot of work time and effort in order to get that property on the contract. And just because you're the guy with the money, you're not the only guy with the money. So we'll go, we'll move to somebody else that's comfortable doing business the way we want to do business. Yeah. And, and going back to something you just said, uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to acquire these properties. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, I, I don't know the right phrase, but one of the biggest, I guess, confusions that some investors have is that when you're a full-time wholesaler, it, you're you're dumping a lot of marketing dollars and a lot of time and effort into running leads and putting in offers that aren't accepted. So when you do finally get a property a contract a property under contract, it, yeah, you might be getting a ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar assignment fee, but not all of that's net profit. There's a oh, lot of no. overhead and 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 cost associated with acquiring that property. Let's talk about marketing a little bit. What kind of marketing are you doing to acquire these properties? So I'm one of the new generation wholesalers, so I'm totally against mailing. Um, our company does not send any mail out, and the reason is is because we have geared our business towards calling. So I have four full-time staff that I have to pay regardless if I get a deal or not. And um, so that's one of the, the risks we take as wholesalers that fix and flippers are not willing to do. I'm willing to spend ten thousand dollars or more each month in order to acquire deals, not knowing if I will acquire them, and that's the risk we take as a wholesaler, and that's what some fix and flippers appreciate and and say, listen, I'm not willing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so with with that being said, I don't do any mailing. We have a lot of uh, outbound type and uh, type marketing and inbound type marketing. I'm heavy with the cold calling. I have two full-time cold callers. We're really one full-time, one part-time. One cold caller can call anywhere between, you know, five to 700 numbers a day with a 10% contact rate. Um, and it's my job as the CEO of the company to make sure they get as much, as much numbers and lists to call as possible. Right. And it's really, you know, that's really that simple what my job was down to. We also have inbound marketing, which we use, we do PPC, bandit signs, and uh, you know other small stuff like that as well. Right. When you generate a lead, either from pay per clicks or the cold calling, are you who's running those leads at that point in time? Do you have an acquisitions person, or are you personally running those leads? Yeah. So I'm I'm completely hands off. I don't look at property anymore. I don't talk to the lead anymore. Um, like I said, I have a staff of four full time. What happens is, let's just say something comes in in our PPC channel. We use Investor Carrot as our website. It's a great converting website. We uh, they go through that lead flow, and then that goes to an email to myself and the act and the leads manager. The leads manager is uh, uh, to call within five minutes. That's our response time. If you don't call within five minutes, it's typically three minutes. Um, they call that person. They go through questions that we have set up, which is a script. And if that she determines how motivated that person is and if the person has equity and if the person has equity, then an appointment is booked. And that appointment is booked with our acquisitions manager that then goes out on the appointment. 
and tries to get the property under contract as low as possible using the guidelines that I've set forth uh, during the training of the onboarding. So a couple of funny things that you just mentioned there. We're, we're both investor carrot clients, mm-hmm. and and I love what carrot offers to real estate investors and wholesalers. And and just recently, I had Trevor Mock on here as a guest in an incredible interview. And you also mentioned that when a lead comes in, you're going to call them within five minutes. And I mm-hmm. think that has to do did, – did Investor Care send us something, or was that on one of their podcasts or something? Because that's something that my company, Titanium Investments, is really big about. And when we get a lead that comes in – we actually all start yelling through the office. We're like, five minutes, five exactly. minutes. You know, it's like, yeah, got to get ready. Who's going to call? And so it, it, was that something that you picked up from Carrot, or is that just like a, a something that you came up with on your own? No, I, you know, I think you're right. I think it's something that they do on their weekly uh, calls. And uh, Adrian, you know, I think they talked about that early, early on. It is something we adopted. And even though they say five minutes, we try to be within three minutes. Sometimes we call the person and they haven't even clicked off the website yet. Um, so, so, you know, the speed kills because what happens is, and I don't know if I was told this by Karen or it just makes common sense. If that person doesn't get a response to me, they're already clicking the next exactly. link. Yeah. And we don't, we don't want to be the what guys that are calling like second place because my guys are so aggressive that if you call after me, there's no chance that you're usually going to get an appointment. Right. And and that's the thing, man. So many times we place those phone calls and they're like, wow, really? Your your titanium investments, you, you're already calling me? And it, <laughs> yeah. and it doesn't matter what time it is. Exactly. Like, it, it doesn't matter if it's 10 p.m. Mm-hmm. you got to call them right then and there. And even if they're, you can apologize and say, hey, ma'am, I, you know, ma'am, sir, I know it's 10 p.m. If you don't want to talk right now, let's schedule a time for tomorrow. But we wanted to call you right now and let you know how serious we are about buying your house. Yeah, making those calls at those awkward times really shows that you're just a small business and they, they actually yep. feel more comfortable doing business with you. You can say, hey, look, I do this full time. You know, this is my, this is how my family eats. So. Exactly. Yeah, you you put in a you put in a request at 10 p.m. I'm gonna call you at 10 p.m. Exactly. So let's go back to outside of that little rabbit trail. Let's go back to the acquisitions <laughs> guys. So a lead comes in. One of your acquisitions guys is is calling the lead. Are they trying to close? Are they making an offer right then and there, or are they trying to schedule an appointment? Yeah. So we have a step process. So we have the leads manager, not an acquisition guy, actually take makes or you know, takes the, uh, the official the first phone call. And that person is trained in building a rapport over the telephone and really finding out the problem that the caller has because it, they're calling because they have a problem, and it's up to us to figure out what that problem is and solve it. Like the underline is yes, I want to sell my house. But it's more than that. Why do you want to sell your house? Because we obviously tell them in our in our script, listen, we're not retail buyers. We buy properties at a discount, but we offer that because we do speed and convenience. Right. Um, so that that leads manager makes that call, builds that report, gathers all the information, and that's put into our investor fuse podio system, and an appointment is booked immediately. And once that appointment is booked, the acquisitions manager that is assigned to that lead gets a notification in their Google calendar and they already know when they need to be on that appointment. And if it's an appointment within the next few hours, then the phone call is made from the leads manager to the acquisitions manager. Gotcha. So when the acquisitions person runs that lead and they're, they're there, I call it the moment of truth with the Mm -hmm. seller, walk us through that process and how are you locking down deals? So our, my acquisitions manager is actually a realtor as well. And ben had his own firm for 12 years, and he has fallen in love with the wholesaling side of business. Now, the cool thing about him, he's also a flipper. He manages flips for his clients. And when I say manage him, he has he's hands-on. He has his own team and the whole nine. So the re, how I met him was I was feeding him deals left and right for his clients, and he was like, how are you doing this? And as I started to scale my business, I offered him a position where he can still do what he does, but he's going to go on two to three appointments a day and he can make, you know, more money by 
closing my deals, selling my deals, you know, getting up to 20 percent on each deal. Plus, he's making money because he's selling it to his guys and he's managing the flip. And then he's going to turn around and list a flip when it's done on host on, you know, when it's done on the MLS. So he goes out, he's trained, he knows the numbers. We have a, a, a wholesaling calculator that we use that is the absolute, absolute best scenario. And, you know, our deal is to get a contract right then and there at the house. You know, that's our goal. We want right. to get the contract. We don't want to leave. We don't want somebody to think about it. And since he is a realtor, we have many options. Listen, if the person's not a candidate for us because everybody's not, then he can list the house. If they don't want to list the house, then we'll go into some creative finance deal where it's owner finance, lease option, something. We have so many tools in our tool belt that we can use that somehow, some way, we're going to be doing business with this person unless they just actually did not want to sell their house. And then that falls on the lease manager because they didn't gauge the motivation correctly. Right. So outside of wholesaling, how often are you taking down properties yourself? So about 5% of the time, we are actually taking a property down and rehabbing it or keeping it for a rental. So let's just say on average, we do between 7 to 10 deals a month. We're probably looking at maybe taking down one every month or every other month. Gotcha. How do you, because I struggle with this as well, as my main source of revenue is from wholesaling, mm-hmm. how do you determine if you're going to keep a property yourself or if you're going to wholesale it. I mean, it's not like all the stars got aligned for me to want to keep a property. And, you know, as, as far as for like for a rehab, a lot of the stars have to align. If it's for buy and hold, I mean, the moon, the stars and everybody, Michael Jackson has to come out and, <laughs> and every, you know, everything's got to happen correctly because it's, you know, it's a cash, even though we make a lot of cash, you know, I got to buy for a 20 year future because I'm in my 30s, I'm in my early 30s, so I need to be looking for something that's going to make me money when I'm 50 and that I can, you know, make a lot. So that's my goal. I have a, I have a more aggressive goal in 2018 to do more buying holes and going to syndication and multifamily type stuff. Gotcha. And do you anticipate only doing things in the North Carolina market? You said you, you're kind of doing some stuff in Orlando. In 2018, do you plan on expanding the markets that you're working within? You know, I slowly will dibble and dabble in certain areas only if I have, if, if, if all the stars align with some of my criteria. Because I know if I can obtain certain city information from the city, and, you know, from the county, if I can obtain all of these stars, what I like to call stacking, if I can if I can get all the things aligned and stack my list in the city, I know I can pull a couple deals a month out of there. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want to pull myself too thin because if I do the formula that most people use, you look at all the cash transactions in 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 North Carolina or just the area I'm in. I'm only representing about four and a half percent of those. So for me to think that I need to go out of my market is ludicrous. There's enough deals, and for me to grow to be actually the number one, as is home buyer in North Carolina, and, and that's our main goal. Going to Orlando is just that. Hey, I ran across a list that was so lucrative; it would be dumb for me not to do it. Right. In in the market that you're in in North Carolina, are you running up against any large wholesale shops? No. So I haven't ran across people like Zillow trying to run into the area, and I've heard of some other guys talk about another company. There's a lot of hedge funds moving in, but they're contacting me to give them property. And I just have an obligation to my buyers there locally that I don't really deal with the hedge funds unless the margins just really don't work for my fix and flippers. Because if I feed them deals, my fix and flippers, it's like the local economy for our thing keeps going. If I hand it to the hedge funds, then it's just going to leave the area in a sense. Right. Well, and I will also say that you're truly blessed that you're in a market that you don't have a whole a large wholesale shop um you know i'm in several markets mm-hmm. that have you know wholesale companies that are I, I think i saw one last night on on facebook saying that they bought like 9700 homes this year and and they're a, they're a wholesale company holy crap 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, so that sounds like Memphis Invest or something. <laughs> I mean, if if you're not running up against a company like that, I mean, if I was in a market that I truly felt like I could be the biggest company in, and there was not a whole lot of competition, yeah, I wouldn't be looking elsewhere, anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, that's part of the reason why we've gone to multiple markets is just to escape the fact that there are companies that are dumping just astronomical amounts of marketing and, and we're always competing against those larger companies. So yeah, I don't blame you for, for not trying to go to a different market. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about your, your fix and flips. I know you said it's only about 5% of your business, but yeah. when you do take those down, um, how are you managing those rehabs? So my, my acquisition manager is an ace, and he has two crews that work with him daily. Um, so I'm able to pick off some of his crews when need necessary. So basically, he manages the, the the construction side of it for me. I'm kind of hands off. I mean, right now, right now I'm in Los Angeles. I, I haven't been home in a month and some change. And the business, uh, you know, December it looks to be the biggest month we've had so far. So. Um, you know, I'm real comfortable with my acquisitions manager and I have another partner with, you know, that works with, with us. And we just set up a system that makes it real comfortable for us to, 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 to be aggressive and, and really dial down the, what works in our area. When you're taking down fix and flips, how are you financing them? Are you using hard money or are you using cash or private money? So private money, hard money, we don't even touch hard money. Um, there's so much money out here. There's no need, unless you just can't build relationships in your local market or you're not from there, there's no need to use hard money. Um, there's enough guys like dentists and doctors that have so much cash sitting around in their bank account that, that if you just make the right proposal to them and you don't even have to make a proposal. I learned something in this mastermind and the guy said, if you know, somebody's got money, don't ask them to invest. Ask them if they know somebody that wants to invest. And it's almost like an insult to, to ask them if they know somebody. They're going to say, hey, wait, wait, I, I want to invest some money. Because if you're giving somebody an 8 to 10% return, they, they ain't getting that nowhere else. So there you go. That was a question on last week's episode on how do you raise private money. And that was probably that, – that was better than the answer that I gave. So for, <laughs> for anyone that listened to last week's uh, podcast, that was the best answer on how you raise private money right there. Yeah, you ask them if they know somebody else. Yeah. Or know somebody that wants to raise, I mean, uh, invest in the real estate. And you, I mean, it's so secure. Their money is going to be, and they'll fund. My guys will fund 100 percent, but their money is secured to something that is worth so much that you got so cheap. I mean, it's almost like I hope you mess up, and that's what hard money does. They hope you mess up. Right. So it sounds like you, you know you have a great system set up, and you really have the business and it's almost kind of functioning without you being in the business. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to take your business in the next five years? Um, Five years. I think if we get to a $5 million a year wholesaling company, um, I think we can do that between one and two states. Then um, I'll be, I'll be happy. I I would look to get my staff up to around 12 people and um, really, you know, pull down $5 million in assignment fees in, in, in every year. Is that increasing by a million dollars a year? Is that kind of the stair step? So we're in, yeah, exactly, each year. So we're roughly, we're on pathway to do a million dollars um, in the next 12 months. Um, right. So if anybody's watched my YouTube channel, my goal was to get to $100,000 every month. We're closing on 85 this month. So w- with us growing in that direction, we're really going, we're really looking to, to keep that increase going. And once we are able to, because our systems are great, but you know, you can always improve your systems. Right. So once we're able to improve our systems and spend more money in marketing and be more aggressive, then I think that each year we should be able to go up by a million dollars, which is, it should be easy. And, and let me touch base on that real quick. You talk about your systems being great. And a lot of times people get confused by what that means. You and I use a lot of the exact same systems, Mm -hmm. Investor Carrot, uh, Investor Fuse, Podio, Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm sure you use call rail and Love it. Things, along, <laughs> things along those lines. We all use those systems. That's not necessarily the systems that he's talking about, though. Oh, no. Those are, those are just tools. Yeah. It's, it's implementing systems with your people and holding them accountable to what their responsibilities are. That's mm-hmm. what separates the successful people from the people who try this business and fail. And, and I'm sure you would second that in that it, it's – Investor Carrot is a great tool. But if you don't use it correctly, it's nothing. Correct. And it has so many functions. And, you know, I, when I say I have a full-time staff of four, um, all four of my full-time employees work remotely. So they work in the Philippines. And uh, they are like family. I, I train them hands-on. I, uh, I know about what they do day-to-day. I know they have kids. I know they, you know, anticipating Christmas. We do bonuses. You know, they're, they, they, it's like they're in my office. So I look at, I don't even use the word virtual assistant that much because it's, you know, it's more than that to me. They're family. If they went on strike, my business would be over with, you know. Exactly. So I treat them accordingly. Mm-hmm. All right. So, you know, after you explaining building this business and essentially in two years and you're up to a million dollars. What is your why? What is your driving force behind creating this business? Well, you know, I've always had a passion in real estate. My uncle taught me some real estate stuff when I was very young. Um, most people know that my both of my parents are Jamaican immigrants that came to America. Um, so I'm first born generation American. And, you know, I don't have any kids. I'm not married. My why is just to be able to provide a comfortable life after my mom retires that she would be comfortable. Um, I really like the idea of financial freedom so that when I decide to be a dad, I can be the best dad in the world. And my decisions are not based upon money. It's based upon, you know, just time. That's awesome, man. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to cut you short on this episode today, but I'm going to have you back on. Um, I want to I want to dive in a, a little bit more about wholesaling, and I'm going to mm-hmm. have like a wholesale roundtable episode, um, probably here uh, in, within the first couple months of 2018. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing insights into your business and how you've built your wholesaling business. As a, a fellow wholesaler, um, I appreciate everything that you do for your real estate investing community. And it truly sounds like you're building a business and you're not just a wholesaler, but you're actually building a company that is going to do amazing things to in the next couple of years. Yeah, RJ, I appreciate you having me on. And, and, it, and it's podcasts like these that helped me when I was coming up. And I hope people take the same from your podcast because it really takes a lot of time and effort to put back a, put out a quality, you know, podcast. Absolutely, man. And I think you uh, you added a ton of value today for for anyone that wants to get into wholesaling. What's the best way that they can reach out to you and, and contact you if they have any questions for you? Well, I'm real. I'm real active on Instagram and YouTube. You can find me on Instagram at the real Maxwell. And if you just search Max Maxwell on YouTube, you'll see me pop up. And uh, you, you know, you can download my free ebook on some of my ten steps that I use, and it's therealmaxwell.com/ebook. It's a free ebook. Just give me your email, and you'll have it delivered to you. All right, Max. Thanks for being on, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, RJ. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Titanium Vault with your host, RJ Bates III. For more info and to stay up to date, visit www.podcast.thetitaniumvault.com and on facebook.com slash thetitaniumvault. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time on the Titanium Vault. Titanium Vault.